Hello, everybody. Welcome to another office hours. I should say, perhaps, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, the first of our summer office hours uh, of this year. My name is Apurva Ashok, and I'm joining you today from the traditional territories of many nations here in Toronto, including the Mississaugas of the First Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I'm very grateful to be enjoying such lovely weather here today, but also for the privilege to be able to live on this land, work on this land, uh, and play here. And for allowing us to come together to meet and learn about um, all things OER. I want to acknowledge that there are many ways in which my own practices and that of Rebus, my organization, can continue to support decolonization and reconciliation work in Canada. So this is something that um, continues to be something I'm mindful of personally, but I'm also uh, grateful that our organization is um, always thinking about and looking for ways to um, make sure this work is embedded into our practices. A little about Rebus in case you are, are new and you haven't heard of us before. We are a charity that helps educational institutions build human capacity in OER publishing and open education through professional development, as well as through the sharing of free resources, guides, uh, and community events like this one. Uh, these office hour sessions are co-organized with the Open Education Network, and I will pass it over to Karen to introduce herself and to, open, to introduce the Open Education Network. Thank you, Apurva. I am Karen Lauritsen. I'm Publishing Director with the Open Education Network, and I am delighted to be joining you all today for another edition of Office Hours with the Rebus community. I am um, based in San Luis Obispo, California, although the Open Education Network is based at the University of Minnesota. I am on the Central Coast in San Luis Obispo, which is the traditional home of the Northern Chumash and I am grateful to live and garden in this place. The Open Education Network is a community of professionals who work together to make higher education more open, and they support one another through conversations like these and sharing resources and strategies for uh, moving forward. So today's session is what happens when my author leaves, policies to support OER. And I'm sure that in addition to our two guests that many of you have some experience to share. So please feel welcome. You're all invited to contribute your experience and questions to this conversation. Uh, Lauren Ray was planning on joining us today from the University of Washington. However, due to a family emergency, she's unable to join us. We are joined by Sam Arungwa, who is Assistant Professor and Extension Specialist, Director of Utah Prevention Science Institute at Utah State University, as well as Rama Kaba Demanin, who is Program Lead at Open Library at eCampus Ontario. And so we're gonna talk today about, you know, what happens after the OER has been out there for a while, what happens when an author leaves, how do we sustain our programs and our resources in the longer term? So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It certainly impacts my work. And uh, without might, further, oh, yeah. go ahead. I might just note for anyone who is new to office hours, if this is your first time attending, this is going to be an informal conversation. So our format typically is to hear from our two guests for about um, five to seven minutes. Um, and then we turn things over to everyone here today for um, questions. Um, if you have your own experiences you'd like to share with the community um, or thoughts, and we'll really let you drive the conversation. But perhaps now I can pass things over to Rama to take us off. Great. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction and for the land acknowledgement. Um, so I just want to add, I am. Um, uh, happy to be here to join all of you. This is my first um, um, uh, after hours, so I've been looking forward to attending one of them. <laughs> so I'm glad I can finally make it, even if it's as, the, as a guest. Um, so I just want to add to the land acknowledgement that Burlington uh, is covered by the same territories as Toronto. Uh, Burlington is also situated, um, is also mutually covered by the dish with one spoon, one palm bell covenant. So I'm in the same uh, boat of just, you know, making land acknowledgement and recognizing all the past, you know, injustice that's been done to Indigenous people, especially in Canada. So 
Welcome again, everyone. Uh, I'm Rama Kava Devani, as Karen uh, mentioned, and I work at eCampus Ontario, and I'm one of the lead for the Open Library. So we at eCampus Ontario Open Library, we serve the unique position of leading and supporting uh, open education and OER initiatives for Ontario publicly funded universities, colleges, and Indigenous institutes. So our position, my position tend to sort of serve as a higher overview lead position whether than um, um, sort of at a uh, prevent uh, at an institutional level. So that's something that's generally tend to be a little bit different than some of uh, faculty or librarians who work within in institutions. So when it comes to creating OER, the open library main service is to provide platforms and a repository to aid our members with creating, searching, and adapting OER. We aren't actual publishers of OER, whether we support our members as self-publishers of OER. And sometimes that may actually be through grants and government initiatives, such as the most historic event um, investment by the Ontario Ministry of Colleges and University through the Virtual Learning Strategy Project, which was a $50 million investment into educational resources in Ontario, um, which majority of went to actual OER. So we are in the midst of cataloging over 400 OERs. So I cannot wait. And I'm sure um, I have my colleague here, Mary, as well as a guest. We cannot wait. So these are actually cataloged and just released out there because uh, they're truly amazing, amazing OER, ranging from simulation, XR, VR, uh, textbook courses. It's just, it's all over the category uh, type map, uh, to say the least. So although we, we have published OER in the past, so eCampus Ontario Open Library did used to publish OER in its early infant stages, because um, we're sort of like a sister version of um, BC Campus. So we kind of started as sort of a, a sister version of BC Campus. So we kind of follow the same ma uh, models, but we soon changed mainly because the sort of post-secondary uh, structure, but also the funding structure in Ontario is completely different. So that's where we kind of had to pivot into sort of changing how we support um, OER into sort of more of a supporting our educators and learners with creating OER as opposed to actually publishing OER. Um, so our decisions and policy we have around data and book retentions come from multiple sources. So we employ what works from a publishing, uh, publishing industry to library and archival process. And that's mainly because of our repository, which tend to be one of our biggest sort of service that we offer is a repository for uh, our members, but also internationally to host and catalog their OER um, after they're done creating them. So we do have different policy for our platform, so such as uh, Pressbook and our own H5P Studio, then we do for our open library repository. So if we look at sort of the platforms we provide versus the actual repository service we provide, we generally tend to have different policies around data and retention. So for example, to address uh, one of the questions, which is whether authors have perpetual access to our publishing platforms, the answer is yes and no. So at the onset, our platforms are reserved for active members only, uh, mainly because they cost money um, to, you know, to make them available essentially. So we check in with our users yearly and we will remove any inactive users after we actually sent out an email to gauge where um, users are in terms of being actively engaged with the platform or not. We don't actually delete any books that are created in Pressbook unless they request to have it deleted. This is mainly because we've learned that um, our members are very collaborative. Like they work collaboratively across, you know, within their institution, but also outside of their institution. So again, because we are a consortium and the way our system is, our press book is set up, someone from the University of Toronto could actually be working on a project or an OER with someone from let's say Conestoga College or Sheridan College. So because of that, we generally don't tend to delete um, an actual book because a lot of the books can belong to multiple authors or administrator. So, and with that also, this also allows the institutions to employ their own policies, uh, not just around OER creation, but also around copyright and who the copyright holder actually is, right, within the Pressbook instance. So we generally try to make sure that the setup of the Pressbook 
authors, administrators, editors is done by the user so that they can apply whatever sort of policy they have around whether this OER is created as part of someone's, um, you know, tenure or job so that we're not interfering with whatever, you know, our requirements they may have. Um, if an author is no longer a member but need access to their book, we do provide temporary access. So that is something we also do. So although we remove you if you're inactive or you maybe switch jobs or you've completely left the academic uh, industry or Ontario uh, public secondary industry, if you still have a book and you need access to it, we will provide access. We'll never say no. And that's why I say the answer is yes and no, mainly because of that uh, uh, flexibility. So our repository on the other end um, is created like a typical library, which means uh, we seek to preserve all additions and derivatives of OER for the long-term benefit for educators and learners. However, we do have the selection process, which is done on a case-by-case -case review for either harmful information, mm -hmm. inappropriate material, or at the request of the author copy, uh, copyright holder. Um, and again, this can come through mainly a user identifying something, we will evaluate, look at it, or sometimes information are no longer relevant. And this again can be identified by a user or by the author or copyright holder. Um, and how do we handle updates and new additions to the open library is pretty straightforward. So additions, we keep all. Uh, we either keep it active or we archive it. Adaption, adaptations, we keep. Um, corrections, we replace. So again, additions, we keep all. We either keep it active or archive it, depending on what the author may want. Um, adaptations, we do keep all of those when they come true. But again, it's also based on any special requests we get from the author. Uh, corrections, we always replace because the idea then is that corrections means that you've identified, you know, enormous error and you don't really want that circulating uh, currently out there. We can't do anything about what's previously been downloaded, but we can certainly make sure that, you know, you are comfortable with what's actually being posted. The biggest challenge we find with uh, updates, uh, as we know, anyone who works in OER knows that they're constantly updated all the time from a small little sentence to 20 videos randomly appearing in a book that weren't there before. And you know, part of uh, what we've learned is really educating the creator and understanding the sort of differences between a correction, adaptation, and new additions, like what constitute an actual new addition, so that you should actually let us know or catalog it as a new uh, item. So we do have a guideline that was put together that we generally always try to send whenever we get questions about correction, addition, uh, or adaptation, we always send that guideline and I'll drop the link in the ch uh, chat shortly. And it's really just walking a creator through, you know, understanding the difference and what constitute which type of change you're making and update. And not just for your benefit, but also for the end user's benefit who may be using the resource and they're not surprised that X20 videos <laughs> appeared and it's still considered the same version uh, type. Um, so who manages updates? Um, it generally is the creator. So for us as a repository, we don't update anything unless we're notified by it. So either we're notified by the user or the author. So that generally tend to be the workflow. We haven't really had time or resource <laughs> to do our own sort of weeding, which really means looking at um, uh, what's relevant, what's no longer relevant, or what's old, what's new. And sometimes we'll randomly do it as, I, as we're cataloging, if we spot anything, we can kind of go like, okay, we can archive this or we can withdraw this because we know that there's a latest version out there or we can uh, you know, preserve this. So an example would be the OpenStack textbook. Generally, it's easy to kind of like identify newer version of this, uh, newer version of those based on the title. So that hopefully summed it up and hopefully I didn't talk too fast <laughs> about the uh, process, but uh, happy to turn it over to Sam and then, uh, yeah, and answer questions later on and hear about others um, pro uh, processes. Thank you, Rema. I appreciate that. You did not talk too fast for me, but might be for others. I, um, I am so appreciative of doing this with you. I think you've laid a good foundation for um, our topic today. When it comes to 
um, sustainability for our open education resources, I, I tend to think a little bit outside the box in, um, in finding solutions to um, issues or challenges that we face. And uh, Rema, you mentioned about resources. So I'm going to lead off with that because um, for profit publishers uh, make profits as part of their business model, and then they reinvest a portion of that profit for what you might refer to as re research and development. And that's how publishers are able to release new editions of their, um, of their textbook or um, resources that they sell. For us in the open community, it seemed that we didn't really think through how we are going to replicate that when we started, which could be good or bad. Good because if you think about it and you didn't have millions of dollars and you're waiting until you have millions, you might not get started. So it's good that we started without really figuring out the um, where are we going to find the resources which now stands at millions, perhaps billions of dollars, if you think more globally, to be able to uh, continue to replicate the success we're having in open resources. And, and so that question has consumed my career. Um, I, um, I happen to have shared a little bit of this with Phoebe. I see that Phoebe is um, here today. I'm really excited because she put me up to this, by the way. And Phoebe and I are collaborating. Um, she recruited me to her team, which uh, where we are working on exactly this issue. So Phoebe out of uh, Oregon, they produce um, the first criminal justice uh, textbook, Introduction to the American Criminal Justice System. And I fell in love with that book years ago when I saw it because I have a PhD in juvenile justice and I have a master's degree in criminal justice and we have no um, open educational textbook in my field which was almost embarrassing when I realized that and I felt like I needed to do something and so I was researching I was working for Texas A&M then and then uh, we ran into that book which was written by uh, Dr. Allison Burke and her team um, in Phoebe's uh, state Oregon and so I've been secretly using it. And what we decided to do when I came to Utah State University, which is where I am now, I've been here for the almost two years. And so the first thing I did was find our open educational resource team at the Utah State University Library. And they welcomed me with open arms. They said, yes, let's go. What can we do to help you? And they told me what they have. And immediately I did what I always do, which is take people in America, literally when they say, you're welcome to, I usually come up with a long list. And I realized that I completely overwhelmed them when I told them I wanted to get this book and revise it in one year and replace. And that was when I realized, oh, Sam, we wanted you to use our resources, but we don't have a million dollars and we certainly don't have a team dedicated to just you because we have to serve a thousand other faculty. And so I had to pare down, but then I shared with them what my vision was about how we can sustain and continue to improve upon the work we have. And the secret source that I came up with is people. If you don't have a million dollars and you have a million students or a million faculty, that's your million dollar grant that we scramble to write. And that led me to a university you would recognize called Brigham Young University, our sister university in the state of Utah. And I ran into Dr. Um, John Hilton, who is a legend in the open educational um, world. And his mentor before him, uh, David Wiley, who also had worked at Utah State University. And I read their work and realized that in some ways they have solved this problem, but it wasn't done in a way that I could relate to it at least. And I know that's happening to a lot of people. So David Wiley, for those of you who don't know, came up with the idea of renewable assignment. I don't know if he came up with it or he certainly made it famous and enough for me to be able to read it on Google, which is where I get all my peer reviewed work. So David Wiley talk, talked about having students do homework 
that would live forever, essentially, and that would contribute to um, making the world a better place. And I thought that is our sustainability plan. Our students come to our class to learn. We can choose to make that learning more affordable by making their textbook open uh, resources. But we can also do it in a way that we partner with them. We do what we call collaborate with our students and make it part of their homework. So I, uh, to make a long story short, I know I have five minutes and I don't know, Rema, I'll have you keep time for me. If I see you wincing, I will stop talking. But what I did at Utah State University is that I went through a process, every university I, I believe have one, sometimes it's called service learning and sometimes it's called community engagement learning, which is sort of the new um, language for service learning. And that is a tool that every faculty has in America and in most of the free world that you can require, you can make it optional, but I like the part about requiring because then more students take it seriously. You can require your students to get up to a quarter of the grade for the class. At least that's the case at Utah State. So I made 25% of the grade in my class to come from an assignment that I appropriately named RAP, Research Assignment Project, not RAP Music. I'm always having to emphasize that. Um, so each of my students, I usually have between 100 and 200 students. Each of them will be required to take a topic from that I would assign or have them choose. So in this case, we break down the textbook into topics. Every textbook on average we found has at least a hundred topics. So we break them, well, we create a table, we call it TOSAT, table of sections and topic for each of our textbooks. And we ask each student to pick one or we assign them one and that becomes their homework. They will get 25% of their grade from developing the open educational version of this topic. If we do that, assuming this becomes successful and I'm betting everything um, I have that it would be, then we would have a million students, maybe a billion students is what I'm really hoping for, who would take one topic at least. Some of them tell me they can handle several, but I'm starting small. So they have worked on this. The data just came in and we're analyzing it as we speak to see if they were able to successfully research that topic and then develop the open educational material for that topic. Whatever they come up with, I refer to it as low quality replacement. And then I will collaborate with my colleagues, which is what I'm doing now with Phoebe and, and our team, essentially. So I would collaborate with what we are calling subject matter experts. They don't have to be professors with PhD, it could just be anyone who have taken interest in that topic and have worked on it, then we upgrade the work of my students to higher quality OER material. And then if you know anything about universities and students, they are renewable resources. When one graduates, another replaces them. And so this is expected to last forever. If we do that, we will be able to replicate what publishers have been doing for centuries, which is dedicate resources to make sure that that topic and that chapter and that textbook and that material continues to stay relevant and continue to stay higher quality every single year. So I fully expect to transition all my textbooks to high quality open educational resources. And I fully expect to release a new edition on the 1st of January of every year till I die. And then whoever takes after me can continue doing it. And I fully expect it will cost exactly zero because I can give a billion A's or B's or grades in every class that I teach. So that is, I think, uh, my idea of solving the problem of sustainability. We've always actually had the resources way more than the publishers have. We just haven't seen our students as the billion dollars that we needed to replace and exceed. So I'm thinking that we should be able to meet and exceed the, what the for-profit publishers are doing. And if you ask me my qualification, I spent about 20 years, I've been 25 years in America, and 20 of those were spent working for for-profit and work part-time for non-profit. Now I've switched the second half of my life. I'm working full-time for non-profit and part-time for for-profit. So I understand both uh, mindset about research and development, and I'm betting that this is, this is a solution. So how am I doing, Rema? I'm pretty sure I've gone more than five minutes 
Okay, so I'll stop there and then we can we can continue later. Thanks. Thank you very much, both of you, for getting our conversation started. And as Aprova noted in the chat, this is this is the time when we transition to everyone who's here so that the conversation can meet your needs and reflect the reality of your work. So um, please feel free to continue to, to talk in the chat or to um, unmute or raise your hand and um, ask a question that way too. We invite your, your input as well as your experience um, making OER more sustainable in the long run. I appreciate how between the two of our guests, we heard sort of the range of um, strategies and methodologies, whether it's, it's based on sort of preserving existing resources or creating new ones. Um, <clears throat> Wait, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about <clears throat> this question of um, deleting a book when requested. Do you have um, a specific scenario that you can think of where perhaps a deletion was requested and, and you struggled with that question, or is it always up to the copyright holder and if they request that then sure thing um, we're taking it down this is <clears throat> surprisingly not something that comes up that often with the open textbook library but it, it has uh, once or twice over the years so i'm interested in your thoughts yeah certainly that's a good question and, and i think it's like you said it doesn't come up often i've only experienced it once um and that, and that one, it was an easy decision, I would say. Um, at the time, I was sort of aware of sort of um, the, the reasoning for it. So I know that it wasn't a difficult decision in terms of taking it down. And generally we try, and I think because of it being open, right? And because we are an open repository, we generally tend to always side with the creator or copyright holder. Um, I myself, I'm a creator, so I always try to take the creator side. Um, and you know, my background is in publishing, traditional publishing, mind you. So I, ge I generally tend to always coincide uh, side with definitely the creator or copyright holder. So I think oftentimes the decision become a little bit easier for us. And luckily we really only had one. Um, on the other side with our H5P studio in terms of interactive content, right? So we've actually, I think the interesting case we've had was where we did have, uh, we've received some notice from a user about sort of, um, uh, uh, videos needing trigger warning signs. So that was actually a whole interesting conversation that we never really considered or thought about because we think educational resources, but then there's different types of, you know, educational resources and different types of um, subjects and field. And so that was an interesting experience. I found, you know, playing that balance between uh, giving the creator sort of the freedom of choice, but also uh, you know, keeping in mind the multiple users that access this platform. So that, yeah, so generally I think we tend to, you know, coincide with the creator. And I think a lot of our decision-making really came about with the virtual learning strategy project because we were expecting to receive uh, a lot of indigenous resource, right? So a lot of my sort of delving to it and really thinking about how to create sort of a policy that respect these type of resources, especially traditional knowledge resource came about really because we were expecting a lot of indigenous resources. So an example would be, you know, they're creating a resource and it may have different interviews. So then if one uh, interview or wants to remove their um, video or have it taken down, can they do that? So that was questions we kept getting from people who were actually putting together these resource. And for us, it was just yes, yes, yes. Because again, one, we were happy to even get indigenous resource and you know, encouraging and opening that door into uh, OER, as we know is extremely difficult, was step one. So, you know, so for us, it was just easy to say yes and you know, respecting traditional knowledge and traditional knowledge label and knowing that things can change. So someone who said yes um, now can say no later because of different circumstances. So we were open to sort of respecting that. We only ask that, you know, for us, we will always connect the creator whenever we get a request. So if we get a request or a user says, I'm in this book, take down my chapter and it's a collection of different chapters by different authors, we will always ensure that 
the main sort of creator or main author or editor is involved in that conversation just to make sure that everyone is aware of that discussion. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> I think I went off a little bit, but. No, absolutely. I appreciate being able to listen in on your thought process because it's um, very thoughtful and I appreciate the sensitivity to creators. It's interesting, you know, you touched on so many things that I think we try to balance, at least, you know, thinking sort of with my open textbook library hat on. And um, it hasn't happened so much in the last few years, but certainly when I first got started several years ago now, um, we heard more frequently from creators who were traditional publishers who had changed their business model and no, no longer wanted that openly licensed resource out there. And so that was you know, a, a little bit of a different decision. So now you're kind of thinking about, well, is the creator an individual who is acting you know, within sort of an educational context? Was the creator um, an organization or um, financially driven company? So I always joke with my colleagues that the open textbook library may seem fairly straightforward in that you're creating metadata to point to the resources where they live online, but there are some surprisingly juicy and intricate questions that come up on an almost weekly basis. So thank you for, for talking with me about that. I just wanna make a note. I think that the comment that Kelly dropped into the chat was related to this topic. And she wondered aloud if something like the trigger warnings you mentioned could be addressed in the metadata or bibliographic info, info page or a note from the publisher or something like that. So I don't know if that's something you wanna comment yeah, I can, on. I can add to that. So that's actually the solution we came up with. So one of the things we did, and, and I always think, Thank my background in public library and customer service because it wins every time. And my first uh, sort of thought was, let's talk to the actual creator um, for these videos uh, that were sort of identified as, um, you know, uh, being just causing distress to someone to to um, to someone else. So as we talked to the creator, and there were actually a few of them, as we talk and engage, we made sure to sort of have it as an open conversation and sort of asking them, what do they recommend? And surprising, not surprisingly, but uh, uh, sort of the actual creators that we had, they suggested that they would actually be fine putting the trigger warning or sort of like an information about it in the description. Uh, so that was what we were hoping for. We didn't want to make it sort of um, a required thing, because again, that balance, and I think at the time there was that whole sort of uh, debate and conversation going on with trigger warning and not. So I, I definitely did not want to enter that um, conversation uh, too much. But, um, but yeah, so that was sort of um, their own proposal. And I think it's because it was a conversation that was happening at almost every institution in Ontario, um, maybe a year and a half ago or two years ago when it happened. So that was sort of the solution. The other part about it was actually system um, hesitation or system, system limitation, I mean. So meaning the system we were actually using didn't have a part in video where you can actually apply this information unless you sort of created your video in a different platform. So that was another thing that uh, we sort of had to consider was that systems and the platform you use can actually limit your ability to apply these metadata information in a visible place to an end user, right? So there were certainly places where they can add this information, but yet it wasn't in a place that was easily visible. So sort of like a cover page or a poster page for a video, depending on the platform they were using. So that was another sort of uh, limitation. The other thing we did was, and I cannot recall because it was a while back, I may have sort of hint at it in our about page, not making it a policy or anything, but just hinting at it as sort of like something to consider. And that's sort of the angle we wanted to take is sort of just reminding people that you, if you're sharing something, just think about who you're sharing it with and to, and everyone can access, um, ac um, access it. So that was sort of our um, thing. I think for the open library in the metadata field, again, I think for us as a repository, we wouldn't necessarily add that information, but we just, but we do encourage or just mention it to the creator to add it as part of their actual resource itself, right? Because if that resource is taken out of our repository, it's best that these type of metadata actually live with the resource as opposed to the system or the repository. 
sounds like you and Sam have a lot in common with the encouraging the behavior in people. And I might just note that a few questions that have come into the chat that uh, maybe are directed for you, Sam, um, um, from Richard and Caitlin, um, that are asking, do students generate case studies as part of that section on, you know, student co-created OER, or is that a separate project? And Caitlin is curious about what the reaction has been from students to have this method, and have there been any challenges from their perspectives that you've heard of? So thank you, Caitlin. I, I will take the second one first, reaction of the students, because it's on my mind right now. We just got, uh, here at Utah State, we refer to it as idea surveys. When students get to grade their professors, and it looks to me like it's it it didn't go as well as planned, but it it's encouraging that uh, more than half of the students um, enjoy the experience. Maybe what I would put at maybe sixty percent now enjoy the experience and were eager to uh, participate. There are other students who felt like, um, so I, I found the cheapest textbook I could. It was about $50. So there were those who said, I paid $50 for my textbook. And now I am investing 10 to 20 hours to try to um, develop a free one for future students. So they feel they didn't quite feel that um, charity, charitable feeling of having to do something for someone else. So. So I have work to do. I have a few months to uh, try to respond to that in some way because that's not um, completely unanticipated. Um, it would be better, I think, maybe a year from now when they have um, a free textbook and then they're improving it. So they would feel like I didn't have to spend any money. But in the initial time, I would have to face these tough questions, which is, I paid for mine. Why should I make it free for? For somebody else, that is a feeling that um, uh, perhaps a few of us wouldn't understand, but it's 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 common. It's human nature. So, the other question about case study, that part is interesting. I wanted to start small, so what we did was just focus on text. So we have two tables we work with. We have one we call table of um, uh, sections and topics. We call it TOSAT for short. Then we created a second table that complement that. We call it tough table of features. So we took the, the one we called features is really non-text features. And the one we call table of uh, topics is really text. We're focusing on the text. So something like case study um, would be included in the text part where they were just um, capturing it in the text. The, value of the non-text features is that we wanted every faculty, no matter their field, to be able to collaborate with us. So we want to outsource every feature in the textbook to uh, any faculty that we consider will be the subject matter expert. So for instance, there are lots of pictures. So we would have the photography professors um, take that on. There are drawings. So we would have our art professors. And then there are audio links, that would be the um, communication audio technology people, there are video links. So we wanted to take the textbook and break it down into a hundred different, um, different parts and then go out and recruit professors. The beauty of universities is that we know everything, right? So we have experts in every particular area and we hope to identify them and go through a process to um, find out how many to divide them into what we are calling high weights and low weights, which would stand for willingness to support, which is a, a survey, a 10 minute survey we created. We will administer it to every professor on the planet. So we divide them into two, those with high willingness to support OER and those with low willingness. And the goal is to start with those who have already have high willingness. So, so I haven't done case study, that's in the works for um, a long answer to a, a short question. We will do case study in the next version, which is in the fall, in a few months, and then I'll have reaction to that. But in addition to case study, we are including, like I said, every part of the textbook, including ancillaries like quizzes, text, everything you normally will get from your best um, for-profit published textbook. We want to be able to replicate that in, in OER because essentially we anticipate we now have unlimited resources, so why not? That's the attitude. 
That's a great attitude. And clearly from our name, Rebus community, we have a shared interest in sort of developing and empowering all of the people involved. Um, as Karen notes in the chat, if anybody here has a scenario of their own that they'd like to share about their own programs or authors who may have left, um, feel free to let us know. You can raise your hand uh, using Zoom and we'll tap in on you. Um, and you're welcome to continue posting any questions um, in the chat. Maybe while we're waiting, um, I have one, um, perhaps for both of you in different ways. Rama, you talked a lot about um, your role as sort of the system or provincial level um, agency that coordinates with representatives at institutions. Um, could you tell us more about what that collaboration process is like? And again, is it a matter of routine periodic meetings where you check in with them about OER that is published from their programs or from their institutions. And I know, Sam, you talked about coordinating with Phoebe and others um, and also tapping into the faculty at your institutions. So how do you both envision that collaboration taking place? And would love to hear from, from both of you on that. Yeah, sure, I can go first. Um, yeah, I think for us, we generally tend to serve a resource role so oftentimes uh, a conversation can start with someone reaching out, emailing us, um, who generally may be new uh, to OER. So the conversation can range from sort of answering what is OER, or um, I want to adapt this resource. Do you have another educator who has adapted this resource I can connect with, which generally tend to be one of my favorite things to do is building that relationship. Um, and it can also range from, I'm already in the process of creating, um, but I need that extra help. And I wasn't able to sort of get that um, support or resource uh, through my institution. So we, so that's generally what my role tend to be, sort of that resource high level. So sort of oftentimes um, those, who, those who reach out to me generally tend to be either an OER librarian or a faculty and, and sometimes even uh, students. So it kind of ranges from all over in terms of the inquiry type I get. And then based on that, the continued sort of, uh, you know, meeting or collaboration will depend. So I have been part of a process where, you know, I've helped someone sort of uh, set up their press book, uh, give a demo of press book, how to use it, walk them through the step, they are creating, um, I don't hear back from several months and all of a sudden they're stuck, they need my help, um, or I don't hear again and then they're done and then they just need that next level. How do I submit to the open library? So yeah, so the process can really vary depending on what they're uh, looking for. And, and I guess, I guess uh, because of my publishing background, I also tend to sort of uh, give a lot of resource relating to uh, if someone wants to obtain an ISBN, and sort of just, you know, best ways to publish their work. So meaning, um, how do I make this available? What are the different types of format I should consider? So I serve more of an educational resource level support and a lot of technical help. <laughs> so I would say maybe, and I think if Mary's in the chat, she's probably chuckling because 80% of my support generally tend to be troubleshooting tech. Uh, things either with Pressbook or H5P Studio and sometimes with other platforms just because I am a librarian by nature I usually have a hard time saying no it's not my job to help you with this I will be I'll always be willing to say yes um, to that so that's just sort of typical interaction uh, with uh, yeah with Ontario it's just again it can be uh, faculty prof level who's creating OER or uh, learning center, the library, I'm invited in to sort of introduce, talk about our platforms, um, a lot of licensing, that's the other thing. So serving as sort of uh, open license, creative common uh, resource type as well. And, and sometimes connecting and reminding uh, people who the actual OER librarian or OER resource contact is at their institution to sort of go there for more support than I may be able to, uh, to give. Oh, thank you. I think Mary put something in the uh, chat. <laughs> thank you, Rayma. And I could add to that the, the angle that we are taking when it comes to collaboration. So I did talk about my uh, connection with Phoebe. I found out about Phoebe because she and her team are managing a federal grant from Department of Education 
to um, update, if you will, the first um, open educational textbook in criminal justice, which was written by um, Dr. Alison Burke and her team. So, so essentially they wanted to do the second edition and it turns out I was working on exactly the same idea. I love the textbook, but I felt like there were aspects that needed to be updated um, for us to be able to use it in um, here in Utah. One of the thing I noticed that was really, that I felt was really important was what we are now calling, and I got this phrase from Phoebe, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I just felt like it needed to be a little bit more diverse, but then um, I realized that that was a focus of the grant they're working on. And so they recruited me um, to, to work with them. And the recruitment happened because I needed workers. So uh, in this university, we operate in semester and I wanted to be able to work 24 seven on the project. And because I'm in criminal justice, I was aware that there is a place in every community called prison or we, we give it all kinds of names, jail, prison, detention facility, correctional facility, essentially where we're holding adults who have, um, who have a, at least a, a higher a secondary education, high school diploma. So we have more than a million people incarcerated in the US who have at least um, um, high school diploma or higher. And we usually warehouse them. There's nothing for them to do. We keep them there as punishment. And I thought, could I recruit them into this cause so that they could, we, I could collaborate with these uh, prisons. And much to my shock, this was a what when I reached out, they said, wow, where have you been all our lives? We've been looking for something for the inmates to do. And, and so we saw an opportunity for us to collaborate, to develop free textbooks, which would then be used to help them gain access to free college education, another passion of mine. So while I was talking to the prisoners, the, our first group of prisoners a few months ago, one of them said, which book are we gonna start with? And I said, Burke et al, which is the only textbook I know the best written uh, in Oregon. And one of them said, have you talked to the author? And I said, no. He said, why would we work on her textbook if you haven't talked to them? And I said, because it's open and we don't really need her permission. And I wouldn't say his name, we call him Doc. Um, and he said, you need to talk to her. He gave me a direct instruction to reach out to Dr. Burke and I did. I had one of my assistants reach out and that's when we connected with Phoebe. And I told him what I was doing and that there was this guy on our team who felt like I need to get their permission even though I told him we didn't need one. And after that meeting, one thing led to another and Phoebe recruited me to become a lead author to, to write the second edition, which is what we're working on right now. So in terms of collaboration, we think of the universe as our resource. Every community in the world has a university serving them. So we call it COMU, which is short form for community university. So we want to partner or collaborate with every community and every university because we have a shared uh, benefit that would come from working together. So that's working with Phoebe, we think is a, a start and talking to you at Rebirth, we think is an extension of that. But I fully expect that this should be a universal effort, unless you can tell me anybody, any community or university that wouldn't benefit from the work we're doing. We shouldn't feel the need to do it alone. I think we should be in hyper collaboration. And my training has prepared me to sort of play a leadership role in bringing every community and universities together because I think sometimes we just have to tell everyone what's in it for them. For my students, I say, this is a quarter of your grade. That usually gets the attention. For a mayor, whether in Oregon or Utah, I tell them, this is the way you provide free college education for all your inmates and lower crime, disease, and poverty. That usually gets the attention. And for a university president, I usually say, this is how you're able to recruit all the adults um, that are qualified to go to college instead of a fraction, because there are many here in Utah is about 100,000 who would enroll in college if they didn't have to pay for textbooks. So, so there's something in it for everybody. We just need to be able to explain it in their language and then sign a contract and collaborate with them. So that's, that's our, what we think of collaboration is think of everybody starting where we are. In my case is Utah and now Oregon and open it up to, to the whole world, which is in a way what I'm doing here today, I like to have more
collaborators from everywhere. Thank you, Sam. And um, we couldn't agree more, as Perva noted in the chat, we shouldn't feel the need to do it alone. And that's the same thing we say in the Open Education Network and is universal to the open ed community, I think, that we're not alone and we're here to support one another and we can accomplish a lot by working together. Um, also, as Aperva noted, we are nearing the end of our hour together and um, I haven't seen any new urgent questions come through in the chat. So perhaps we'll begin wrapping up. Aperva, is there anything else you'd like to ask? I'll just ask our guests if they maybe have final comments and for those perhaps with the financial means to plan and budget for this work are there any suggestions that you might have for folks on the call who are maybe writing grant proposals about oer initiatives or oer projects and suggestions that you have either to train individuals to do this work and to, to keep this rolling or to budget out uh, the resources needed to develop those policies that you didn't realize you needed until the, the uh, needs rose. So any suggestions or final comments, feel free to jump in. I think I can add a little to that, mainly just what I've observed through our virtual learning strategy project, which was really a collaborative effort among many faculties across different institutions in Ontario, but also um, with Ontario businesses as well. So just seeing how, you know, the projects came about, how people coordinated, work together, and the challenges that they've encountered. And I think it's, um, it's like you said, having that, those policies in place really save a lot of those projects that were successful and were able to actually finish their project and submit their final uh, uh, final resources, especially during the pandemic. <laughs> so this is all happening during the pandemic. When I think about you know those who had videos schedules that they were going to shoot but never happened because the lockdown. Uh, so I think just having that policy in place and just having um, you know different um, consideration for how you're going to treat risks and identifying those risks that may happen throughout a life cycle of your project, I think is important because on one hand, you know, creating an OER is, it is a project. Like, I think I've definitely come to realize that and I feel comfortable saying that it is not the same as writing a book, it's creating a project. And I think it's because of that multiple um, aspect that really goes into it, all the different resources that you're going to need in order to create a great quality um, OER. It really is a project. And I think uh, my recommendation really would be to treat it as a project. And, you know, if you have it set up as a project, then this, I think, will allow you to succeed. And part of that is thinking about retention as well. So, once it's out there, what and how do you expect to treat any updates that you do to your resource? So some of the resources have already identified that. And for us as a repository, it makes it easy for us to identify that this is a dynamic digital resource. I'm now going to provide a printed version of it or an exported PDF or XML because it may change tomorrow. So I'm just going to leave it as an online resource. So just something so small, but yet so important when you start cataloging and being able to identify a resource that already says I'm dynamic, I'm a living document and I will be updated frequently. So that's sort of my, my cap summary. Thank you, Rema. I would build on, um your comment that OER is a project. And like every other project, it requires uh, resources. I think we we started out in the OER community thinking that um, because it's free, that somehow we would get away with um, focusing on the initial part of the work. We, have, we never really think through what we are tackling today, which is what happens after that initial publication. So the sustainability part, I don't think we should be continuing how we started because we've had decades of um, experimenting with this. It is time to make every OER um, as sustainable as humanly possible. And that's certainly the approach we take when we look at OER to break down. In this case, I'll talk about a textbook because that's where I live. So. We look at 
the book as a hundred topics, if you will, and each one requires updating, each one requires improvement um, over time. So we should think about it that that improvement needs to be happening 24 seven. At any given time in the world, there is someone who can be incentivized to contribute to it. And that someone most likely would be a university student or faculty or someone who is incentivized differently. I call it non-monetary reward or non-monetary compensation. So um, when I give my student 25%, it's almost the same as giving them uh, $25 or 25,000, whatever currency you want to use. If I'm in Nigeria, where I was born and raised, it would be like 25,000 Naira is the value for them. And, and so the, when it comes to sustainability, we need to think about, in my work, we call it surplus resources. The universe is filled with surplus resources that would pay for sustainability. Here in Utah, we have two law schools. And in the next few weeks, I'll be sitting down with both of them to ask if they would start a new field of law that I'm calling OER law, because I found out they have about half a dozen different areas of law. And I thought, where is OER in your curriculum? And they look at me like, what is wrong with you, Sam? And I said, I was a paralegal. I was told you guys are the only ones on the planet who can just create a new curriculum in your, can you add one? And, but I am in the process of selling them why this is important to them because in the field of law, they have what is called pro bono law where they're supposed to contribute to reducing poverty. Imagine if they created a new field of law where all my legal OER needs can be taken care of for free. What can I do with that? What if every law school on the planet, whether in Nigeria or China, Ontario, you know, Iraq, whatever, are implementing? So we have the resources. The biggest lie told is that we don't. We have more resources than for profit. We just need the intelligence to tap into it. And I hope to have more detailed conversation on how we do that because the best part is we already have the money. We just, nobody told us. And now I'm telling you. So that's my final comment. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, Rama, and everybody else here today. Um, we are at uh, 3 o'clock Eastern, that is. Um, I will also just note in the chat, I've dropped in a link to a form to do some future thinking and envisioning for office hours as well. Um, do we want to continue this conversation? Do we want to tackle another topic? Would you like to hear from other speakers? Please let us know. Um, these are always community organized events, hopefully for community. So we'd love to hear from you what you'd like to discuss as a group to move this forward. And for now, I just want to say thank you so much to our two guests. Um, I appreciate just the reflections that you brought, the uh, language that you've used, and the questions that you've left us thinking with, um, and solutions as well. As you all noted, you know we're here to, to resolve this together. Um, we hope to see all of you next month at uh, our next office hours. And in the meantime, hope you all can take care. Enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you are, and look forward to seeing you in about a month's time for our next session. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>